All right. I put the button. Hit the button. I don't want to end up lecturing too much, so just oh, you push the button. We push are the in button. fact live, so welcome everyone to Artwolf's Lair, where we have designer Patrick Mullen of the upcoming A Hot Dry Season from Legion War Games. Um, I'm on the pre-order page right now. We'll take I a look at the, the Vassal module. The There's some proceedings. I don't want to end up lecturing too much. Video of that. Um, so we can uh, I, we can point you to that. And uh, next week, I think we're going to start another longer scenario. Uh, so, Patrick, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Um, let me get started with, I know we've talked quite a bit about... Um, your interest in the Vietnam War and the Vietnam period. So before we get into the specifics of the research that uh, that you had to undertake for a hot dry season, uh, point us if you wouldn't mind at a if if we have anyone listening who is not particularly familiar with the Vietnam War, is there a good like one or two or three volume source on the Vietnam War that, that we can point people to? I'm thinking something like uh, McPherson's Battle Cry of Freedom for the American Civil War. A military history? Yeah. Your, your best bet it, to this day, sadly, and it, it's kind of a state of the military history, historiography of the Vietnam War, is the um, the official U.S. history, which I think I was talking to you about it the other day. It's actually not caught up in the time period of the immediate aftermath of the war. The army didn't. The army's of history. The army history wasn't written until late '90s, early 2000s is when they started to work on wow. it. And yeah, it, it, there there were some monographs written in the wake of the conflict and. Um, some are, were very valuable to me as resources, more in the sense of it was written like a good example is like U.S. artillery, 1965 to 1975. Right. So so they're not concerned with like relating to you the, the kind of operations, which gets caught up in propaganda and outcomes, you know, at that time. Right. You know, like, was this operation successful or not? It's just relating to you. Hey, this is how we utilized artillery. This is how fire bases got set up. The tactics, techniques, and procedures. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, so, so they're 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 to this day great sources, or at least starting points as sources, right? To go find other information. And so, so that there was this, like I said, this Vietnam monograph series that was released in the 70s by, <coughs> I think then it was the, um, I forget what they called it. Today it's called the Center for Military History. But you know, you know, it's basically Army Military History. And it's the Marines, the, okay. the Marines wrote an official history immediately after the conflict. And it's very biased. It, it, it's not very well informed uh, in terms of really pulling at the, at, at the uh, historical records and, you know, relying on things that you get over time, right? Declassified documents, you know, ARs and sit reps that are declassified and can be poured through. So it, it, it's very immediate. Um, but oper- like getting an operational military history it, it, it it's it one still hasn't been done what what you get when when you read general histories of the vietnam war like a a, a very good one was released in the last um two years by um sir max hastings uh but even he continues the tradition of what we had which were former journalists writing about the war and all of them were journalists during the war so they all have an axe to grind and I, I don't mean that from a political standpoint. I mean, I've got a perspective, right? It, you know what I'm saying? And right. and I'm writing this history to justify that perspective. And those are just general political histories, you know, overviews. So, and the operation side of the house was was, was just not, you know, you you, you, you didn't read much. You, what what you see, even what you see out there today, like if you look at like the Battle of the Iadrang, for instance, the the seminal book on it isn't a great operational and instruct you very much operationally about the campaign that led to the battle of the Iadrang. It's a, it's from a, um, a journalist and a battalion commander's perspective. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, from a small unit perspective. So it, it, that's just one of the battles of this. So for me, that that was like one of the prime battles of, uh, struggles in terms of doing the research for Attleboro was that you know I 
I was never going to do something like read one secondary source or two secondary sources and make a game. It's not me, but like to start with almost there, there wasn't a coherent narrative of the operation. You, you had certain stated goals that were very broad. So that it required a lot of digging through a lot of different sources just to get after it. If I was going to recommend anybody who says, look, I just want to understand these operations and what they were trying to do. I'd recommend, and the good news is it's free on PDF, right? Just go to the Center of Military History, and they yeah, have well, the official history. A lot there. of the Army stuff is, the World War II stuff as well. Right. And Dr. McGarrigal, who wrote um, the volume that has a, the chapter on Attleboro, is is a fantastic historian, very, very clinical, very unbiased. But it, that was, like, uh, the copyright did, I, 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 like, I think I have on my bibliography, or, and I've thrown out there's the most recent re-edition of it but i think he wrote it if i recall correctly in 2002 is when it was published okay which shows you the distance you know between the you know what i mean between writing that volume and, and the actual but in the in the actual conduct of the operations but you know it has the benefit of time there are you, you know he he's able to consult vietnamese you know north you know vietnamese archives he's able to consult uh Decla like I said, declassified records. Sit down years later, interview um, General Dupuy. Dupuy, I always mispronounce it. Who's the uh, first infantry division commander and others? Yeah, you know what I mean. And, and, and put together this this very nuanced view of what of what was occurring at the time. But you know, that's for Adelbert. And really, I think that's the way to read about, get a feel for the operational conduct of the war. Is is that's that's really the only place to go right now someone someone's got to just write that book yeah you know and, and, it, and it hasn't been written so uh, that that's a complicated answer to your question I, I i was interviewed by the player's aid about that and the four things i threw out were um westmoreland the one the general who lost the war by lewis sorley which is more covering westmoreland's tenure mm -hmm. but the, the salient sections were that deal with Attleboro and the fighting around war zone C, you know, in 60, 66 and then going into 67, the official history, right. You know, Dr. McGarrigal, um, uh, uh, there's a great book called grab their belts to fight them by, uh, uh, Naval Institute press, which it really talks about that. That talks about the Politburo's decision and Cosvin's military preparations and conduct before Attleboro, funnily enough, it really ends in August of 66, but about how, how their plan to conduct the war aggressively in 65 and 66, you know, which is, which is an interesting counterpoint to what we think of popularly, right? Which is that we fought maybe at Iadrang or something. And then there was a lot of guerrilla war. And then there was a Tet, you know what I mean? In the popular mindset. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, we lost faith and then there was like an offensive in 72 and then we left, you know, and what really happened was, um, Cosvin leading up to Attleboro and leading to Attleboro directly is that Cosvin and the Politburo were determined. They were very frustrated. Um, but as a result of the Buddhist crisis in 63 and 64, and uh, their increasing military successes in that period, the South Vietnamese government was getting more and more unstable, right? And then you had the coup against Diem in late 63, and then the, the, the Buddhist crisis continues into 64, and you kind of have musical chairs of, of, of governments taking over South Vietnam, you know, new set of generals coup, right? You know, so, so the government's more and more unstable. And they really felt that victory was just in their grasp. You know what I mean? That they could topple this government Mm -hmm. And everything was good, just going to fall apart, and you know there'd be, there'd be uh, you know a commiserate populace, a popular uprising, and they would win. And so, the U.S. intervention was you know of, with ground troops, you know, in combat operations in '65. In my opinion, frustrated them. They 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 felt victory was right within their grasp, and so they didn't change their strategy and go guerrilla per se. What they decided they were going to do was keep doing these offensives in selective areas. You know, and they they told themselves that the uh, U.S. anti-war movement was far more uh, impactful on U.S. policy than it was in 65 and 66. And that if they, they just, you know, were very aggressive and, 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 and you know, they, they'd simultaneously continue this momentum of trying to topple the government, cause casualties, 
you know, and it would, it would you know, and, and it, it, the U.S. would know what the imperialist dogs would no longer be able to protect the South Vietnamese government. And they could still win right now. And that just wasn't the case. And one of the things about Attleboro that fascinated me is it was after Attleboro that Cosvin did indeed go to a more. When I say guerrilla, there's I don't mean literally pacification in guerrillas locally in provinces. I'm talking about use of the PLAF and uh, PAVN, the North Vietnamese Army. So, you know, the VC main force in the North Vietnamese Army. Mm -hmm. It was then that they made a decision to say, OK, we may, when it's very, very beneficial, launch attacks, launch, you know, but nothing approaching an offensive. What we're going to do is engage in these battles along the border. Because we have this plan for this big offensive in 1968, Tet, right? So we're going to pull back and prepare for that. And uh, we're going to try to draw the Americans out, you know, fight them in defensive, you know, far more defensively, let them launch operations against us in more difficult terrain in, in plans of our this masterstroke we have planned for Tet. Which... So they, they planned Tet that early then? They were starting to think about it by early 67. Hmm. I had not known that. Right. So if you think about it, and Tet was not a military success. Tet was a public relations success. Mm -hmm. It was not a success uh, amongst winning in terms of winning South Vietnamese population to their side. It was not a success in terms of their, their stated operational goals of what they wanted to accomplish. Okay. But you know, it won in the, in the living rooms of America famously. Right. But that wasn't their intended goal for the offensive. So if you think about it, the pull-up bureau is not on the right track this whole time operationally. They're like, well, we're just going to stay being aggressive and we'll be able to accomplish the goals that we wanted to, you know, that, that, that we have within our grasp that, you know, that hasn't been, that hasn't been stolen from us, but it didn't happen. Then they said, well, we'll pull back a little bit, but what we're going to do is launch this really big offensive. And then that didn't work. And then they kept launching offensive, these mini tets after that in 68 into early 69. And that's really finally when they, the Viet Cong main, main force, as, as we'll see, as, as portrayed in the game was bled out as a force, hmm. you know, ceased to exist. And then, you know, and, and as well, pacification starts to greatly increase through South Vietnam in terms of, um, you, you know, local guerrilla activity, et cetera. You know, pacification starts to really work. A lot of that has to do because that big stick, that Viet Cong main force that can defend local guerrilla cadres, you know, against pacification efforts, you know, against the South Vietnamese army starts to go away. But it does. It, so the conflict completely then changes into a an attritional battle of wills between South Vietnam and North Vietnam, you know, and North Vietnam is going to win that because the U S is on the clock. They're on the way out. The American people won't tolerate a further commitment. So that that's one of the reasons I found Attleboro so fascinating. It's the last really big offensive conducted by the PLAF uh, before Tet. If you think about it, all the famous things before Tet, like all the stuff around Quezon and all that, it, that's maneuvering. No, but you know what I mean. No one launches mm -hmm. an attack. Divisions are maneuvering into position. There, there, there's a a big operation called Operation. It's really two operations: Greeley and MacArthur, made famous by the Battle of Docto, that occurs in '67. But once again, that's the NVA in the Central Highlands kind of moving in and securing defensive positions. They launch a couple of local attacks, but it's really the U.S. in, in the boonies close to the border. Yeah, you know what I mean? Trying to defeat these the, the, these large forces that they know are out there. But mm -hmm. this is, um, you know, and, and the, the NVA stand and fight there. But, you know, other than that, they're, they're, they're trying to avoid what we would call an operational conflict. You know what I mean? They'll have tactical conflict here and there, but they're, they're trying to stay away from big operations. Big because, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, no. So, because they're they're planning. Gord makes an interesting comment in the chat. It's true. Checking on stream health. Stream health seems okay. Yeah. Can you guys hear us in the chat? this is Discord flaking out. Can you hear me? Pardon us, folks, while we address technical concerns.
Can you hear me? Hear me now? Hello? Patrick, can you hear us? I, I... I hear you just fine. Well, that's very interesting. You didn't unplug your microphone, did you? Nope. Nope. You were clipping, clipping along. Uh, Patrick says he can hear me. Um, but I cannot hear him, and presumably you and us folks in the uh, stream cannot hear him either. I sound weird and slurred. Well, that's because I'm drunk, but I mean, not really. But um, that's strange. Let's uh, let's hang this thing up again. Can you hear me now? How about now? I I hear you. Nope. Patrick says I still sound weird. Um, folks, for for those listening, um, do, does is my audio okay? Gordon says he can hear both of us. Why can I not hear can both you... of us? So. Because the problem is likely a software issue on your end, but you can't hear me. So we might be having a technical problem on my side then. Crank that up. I don't have you muted or anything. Oh, it's probably at this point if the stream can hear you, but that's there's no way because the desktop audio is not coming through. That you can make see any sense. I sound weird. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at the chat. I sound all weird. All right. Um, so I don't know the way to solve that short of stopping. So let me start it again. All right, how about now? Can you hear me? Anything Can different? you hear me? Sound better? Sound worse? Um, can you guys still hear me in the chat? Somebody just speak up. All right, I don't know what's going on. Let me make a test here. All right, I don't know what's... Okay, so... Let me make a test here. Uh, yeah, something weird's going on. I am actually... I actually went in to listen to the uh, to the to the stream for a few seconds, and I do sound weird and distorted. I believe the problem is on my side. What the problem is, I haven't the vaguest idea. However, um, I'm getting about four and a half percent drop frames, which shouldn't be a big problem. Yeah, it... Um, oh, uh, there you are. You're back. Okay. You were getting a lot of um, spinning going on on your on your on on the stream as I see it on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's, something, it's something with your upload. Is uh, my yeah, that's a, probably a bandwidth problem then. And then it's probably Discord trying to fight its way through that. 
Right. I'm starting to think we should be using stream Streamyard in the future anyway. It oh, seems to not could. have. Yeah, it seems to not have any of these issues. Can you still hear me? I can hear you just fine now. Yeah, you do sound. You do sound like a drunk ogre. Okay. Like you're at, like, like no, seriously, like like you're at 0.85 speed verbally or something. So I still sound weird. like that. Yeah, you do. That's weird. Yeah. So anyway. Um, you know, I forgot what that, yeah, uh, <laughs> we were talking about, yeah. yeah well, that's, that's okay. Great. So, um, let's talk, I'm going to continue looking at this on my side, but while I'm doing that, uh, I might as well ask you about your gaming inspirations, uh, for a hot dry season in terms of war games. I don't, you know, that's really hard to say, man. I, um... I, I was thinking about that. I, I really sat down after I did the research and, um, you know, I developed an OB and felt like I developed an understanding of what occurred during the operation and uh, what I wanted the campaign to do. Um, I just kind of sat down and wrote up mechanics that I, a system that I thought fitted the operation. You know, that would let the players effectively play the commander of the operation from each side at the scale I wanted to use. But the I, I was thinking about it, you know, and I've been thinking a lot about it. And I, I think my, my, my four biggest inspirations from a design standpoint are probably they're people. It's not even games, right? So it's um, one big influence game is uh, Nick Karp's Vietnam 1965, 1975, just because just it kind of got me on the vietnam journey and it does a lot of interesting unexplored directions about like um hidden movement and you know limited information that 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 i don't think a lot of games dealt with and it was certainly my first exposure to a game that really dealt with that in a serious way practically goes without saying in fact right i think my my second big inspiration is, is mark herman um he doesn't design a lot of games these days that really float my boat um you know i want to say in the last five years or so but his approach throughout his 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 career designing of um really designing to fit this the history you know so no system just we're gonna do whatever it takes here to do whatever i want to do whatever scale i'm doing to to provide a game that works with depth for two players you know what i mean so rather than constantly going back to the same bag of tricks just just doing what applies he's talked about that in at least one interview that i've seen too where uh for for him the mechanics emerge directly from the history right exactly so so what situation are you dealing with uh what problems do you have to deal with what do you want to reflect well that's gonna that's gonna result in the mechanics not the other way around and then um, I think my third biggest influence was, uh, you know, it, there's no particular order, but early Dean Essig, um, we've talked about that mm-hmm. in other streams we've done, like like Brigade Combat Series, more more in a sense, like I said, of how to approach a campaign, right? You, you know, um, no scripting, very wide open, um, tr- trying to give, you know, pr- players the broadest latitude to deal with. Um their side as a commander. So they're expressing themselves in their, in their strategy and what they're doing. And my final is a guy who really, I think approaches games a lot the same way uh, Mark Herman does. And that's um, Frank Chadwick. Mm -hmm. I always say Frank Chadwick when he isn't going crazy and trying to do Europa. Right. Or, or or this thunder in the East thing, but just like, okay, here's this, here's a theater. Here's something on the operational level, et cetera. What do I need to do to make this happen? You know, like, like, what systems do do I want to have in here? How do I want them to work? What, what what's going to fit it? Mm-hmm. So, so that that was kind of like I I think that's really my biggest influence in terms of of the design of uh, of the system. You know, so so like like the system it's like the sy- system for AHDS itself. I just said, well, okay, I want to get after the fact that yes, there's indeed hidden and limited information for both sides, right? But how do I um, how am I going to go about doing that? Well, I'm going to need uh, ISR. We're going to have an ISR phase, and we're going to probably have it at the beginning and the end of the day, you know, once or mm-hmm. twice, and uh, a, a specific time when that occurs. And the way I want to deal with it is through that U.S. doctrine conceit of intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. 
and then we'll see what you know what we'll, we'll, we'll model those functions the intelligence ones the surveillance ones the reconnaissance ones right okay so that was easy you know easy we'll do and you know we'll do it through a, a command rating which is really a proficiency for units doing non-combat tasks that's that's how that came up and you know and i thought about things i wanted units to do besides fight um you know i didn't just you know that's one of the big things was the fires phase, you know, how are we going to handle fires? This has to be handled here. Um, it's not Vietnam if you're not dealing with, you know, attacks by fire by both sides, and how they're coordinated, national differences, right? So that had to be dealt with. And, you know, that's it. Yeah, you, know, you know, so, 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 so it was a ground up build, but it was, but, but I, I think mechanically there were certainly some influences. Like I talked about Dean, I, I, you know, I've always been a fan in all his games of the of the rounding rule, mm -hmm. round normally, right? Because because I'm I, I, I've always like, why are we rounding down? Yeah, you, you, you know, you know, in all these war games that I play, and yeah, yet you know? for decades that has in fact been the default. Games right. have to right. go out of their way to say, no, we are going to round. You know, using the math rules, not the war game rules, which is weird. Right. I and I. I I'm kind of used to it now, but I balked at that. I, I thought felt like that made the math more complicated to use the math rounding rules rather than just dropping fractions. Right. I I made that decision in this game, like, but you know, so one, I like it, right? But two, I made the decision because look, you're gonna have plenty of times where somebody's attacking somebody, and you de you declare the attack, and you at you know, I'm throwing in this support, that support, but you don't really know what you're attacking. Yet. Right. You know? It's interesting, actually, that that, uh, that that is also the case in OCS, where yeah. we use the math rounding rule, and you don't always know what you're attacking. Right. So that 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 was my thought, uh, you know, and th that's why I approached it that way. But that, that so that was like an influence from Dean. Um, the, uh, you know, so just that sort of thing. I think I think how I look at fires, you know, some some of it's from my you know, my, my, my personal background, my career background, but part of like expressing it in games, a lot of that comes from Frank Chadwick, you know, um, who in, in all the titles I ever played, he, he didn't seem to like shy away from like, wow, how are we going to deal with artillery and air? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you deal with it. Yeah. You know, and, and, and right. th that's part of the national differences as well. Rather than an abstracted way into a, an uninteresting, uh, yet still burdensome, design right. facet uh, yeah yeah so you know th that those are really my influences i, I guess is a, is a good way to put it uh, you know it I'll, oh and silver bayonet it certainly inspired me in terms of the scale mm -hmm. I, I thought that that to do the operational scale in vietnam i thought mile hexes and i thought company was the right way to go mm -hmm. you know and, and that that that's a huge influence you know that, that that I won't deny. You know, yeah, I didn't want to use that system and I had to go to scratch and build something. But but those basic facts, uh, you know, I thought were the way to go. So now that we've seen um, we meaning the audience for the for the streams, uh, now that we've seen in the previous streams a, a taste of the game system and the mechanics, what would you consider to be this? If there is a signature feature of this game design, what would you consider that feature to be? I think ISR. And hidden and limited information, the way it's handled, fixed, unfixed, ISR platforms, how they work. Um, uh, I, I think that's the number one signature feature. I, I think if there's a second one, it's for this operation anyway, how I'm handling fires, you know, integrating mm -hmm. it all. It, fires is a separate thing, you know, not being baked into a tank attacking twice or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like in integrating the fires. I, I think that those are probably the two things. Okay. Is there another, uh, other than the ones you've mentioned, which is Nick Karp's v Vietnam uh, from Victory Games and GMT's Silver Bayonet, which I think is a Gene Billingsley design, I think. Um, are there any other particularly noteworthy Vietnam War games that you've played? <sighs> So man, I'm trying to think of uh, I'm trying to think of one that I'd really recommend. Um, you know, I played Fire in the Lake. <coughs> I actually yeah. haven't played that yet. Uh, um, I'm trying to think tactical titles. There's a Joe Miranda title I never remember. I'm really horrible at remembering titles of games I played once or something. 
Um, they're good. I, I one of the things that at the operational scale anyway that 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 is I've never played really played anything that's knocked my socks off. Which is one of the reasons I, you know, I'm not saying this will knock people's socks off, but I wanted something that really, really captured. I, th I think there are a lot of simple decisions made or, um, you know, m m most of the operational titles that were out there were, were like a magazine game for S&T, which always have inherent limitations. Oh, yeah. You know, um, there, there's, a, God, there's this one title for, also from S&T where they made the decision to try to do some stuff in the iron triangle but it's like a battalion scale and it just it just does not work um so that's that tactical titles i've i've played a lot of i played a a lot of miniatures in funnily enough in frank chadwick's um command decision system which is like a platoon scale doing miniatures work fantastic um you need a referee you know and the mm. ability for referee to to do hidden movement but that was pretty fantastic front towards enemy by joe chacon is is really good i've heard very good before. things about that you know i like it and what one of the decisions i think he made that, that i really think were wise what was wise is he, he went for fire team as the prime scale rather than squad hmm. it kind of kind of the same like if i and, and i and i i like the variety and variability it gives you're it, everyone's so used to squad for like mm -hmm. tactical yeah but that's you know? because of world war ii right you're starting to get to these very sometimes specialized platoons specialized companies you, you know what i mean for for both sides even in this conflict right you know and and i think fire team at the tactical level once again lends itself to that kind of granularity just like i think company does a better job of reflecting all these different types of battalions that are out there yeah, you know the different mtos that we were talking about you know like you, you know not just us but like arvin you know in fu future like when i'm doing a landstown 719 you, you get different vietnamese divisions that have different mtos that have very practical effects on things you know and you can only get at that from the company scale mm -hmm. so i think i think chacon made the same wise decision by going down to fire team for front towards enemy yeah you know, it's a sharp looking box too i have to yeah, have to say i I really love the box cover. It's very simple and gets it across. One of those things I'm kicking myself for actually not picking up at uh, Winter Offensive. Winter Offensive? Winter Offensive. Uh, when I was there. It was Front Toward Emmy. It, it looks good. Uh, there were some people playing it there, too. And, and Joe was there, if I'm not mistaken. I know he was there, but I didn't talk to him. So... Um, so would you uh, would you say you're so I mean with the caveat that there's always gray areas and many if not most games will straddle the lines that we draw wherever they are in some capacity would you consider yourself as favoring like a tactical or operational or strategic level I generally prefer operational um I I I like the combination of level of detail, yet um, I, 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 yet I like the the scope that it covers. So so I'd pretty much fall into that area. I I, I I'll play something tactical if it's um, well thought out. Um, you, you know I, I I don't like most of the, like some of the car driven. Um, tactical stuff that's out there mm -hmm. recently just hasn't floated my boat. Yeah, I feel the and, same way, and I think I think we all know what game we're talking about at that point. Right, and, and, and you know, and people can like it, but sure. it just, it just kind of doesn't do it for me. Um, but I can, uh, but I also like you know strategic rants. You know, I'll, I'll I'll play anything. I'll play like you know, you know, like Total or Krieg. I'm planning to play with a friend. Yeah, you know that. Oh, kind that's of a thing. nice game. Also, right, so I'll do that. But I. Generally, if like if given my druthers, if I was going to spend time playing a game, it'd be at the operational scale. Like I was, I was getting ready to play. Um, uh, you, you know, I sometimes play Blue Tweezers. You know, you know, post play live mm -hmm. stream, and we were we were looking at playing Napoleon at Bay, and uh, we were playing, it, loving it. But he made the you know, it's not that good visually for a live stream. Oh, it's no, no, it's right, right, kind of old and ugly. In fact, so we're. We're gonna do um, 
Nemesis. Oh, uh, the Burma game yeah, from yeah. Is that Legion? Yeah, okay. exactly. Exactly. Is so, that a Kim I, Kanger design? That is indeed a Kim Kanger okay. design. So yeah, I mean, you know that that that's kind of my preference in gaming is 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 that operational scale, uh, you know, uh, you know, tactic or small unit. I was going to ask uh, if uh, about periods as well, uh, but then I think we we're all aware that you're perfectly comfortable with American Civil War at this point. So, I and, and I, Vietnam. I I really to be honest. So I yeah, I mean, I could talk about Vietnam all day long, but I really love. Um, maybe my number two now, you know, since I've kind of faded out from World War II gaming somewhat, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just World War II'd out, you know, unless it's something very particular, like Burma, right? Mm -hmm. I'll give that a try, you know. But I really love, not just the American Civil War, but I really kind of am a fan for anything from post-American Civil War before World War One. You, you know, okay. you, could, you, could, you could just pitch any bo like a boer war game at me and i'll just play it okay right? franco prussian then, war falls in that period as well right, right i and i and i um yeah it's just you know i i just love that period and it's so underrepresented and yet you know the the the, the tactical and operational conflicts are usually neat and interesting when they occur that you know you just you know i'll, I'll play one at the drop of a hat you know and then regret it later but yeah i, I really love really love that period um yeah so yeah i i like i like the 19th century but more or less like i love the history i love to play it i don't think i'd want to design for it i'm happy enough just playing it i think that's you know? fair yeah yeah that's a it's like pre there's a, a big gap in my uh library and interests that is like that late medieval renaissance age of reason type of period where i have very little on that period and uh, at least half of what i have got picked up at compass expo last year with that uh no peace without spain series it covers a lot of those oddball conflicts in the late 1500s early 1600s uh late 1600s early 1700s the like the war of the spanish succession and yeah oh yeah yeah the, the I, it's war the, the league way. of augsburg and that kind of stuff I own both those. No peace without Spain and the nine years thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, yeah, I got them both. Okay. That's another. I, I like kind of the everything up to Napoleonics. Yeah, and those know? are card driven that, too. Uh, but yeah. I, I feel like a card driven solution works well for that period. Uh, it's yeah, interesting yeah. that that I, I really strongly dislike card driven games in World War for World War Two. The only exception I can think of of a World War II card-driven game that I think is a good war game and a good simulation is uh, Empire of the Sun. I I just think it, you know, I think a lot of people get hung up on the mechanics of the design first rather than the period and the scale of what they're covering and then choosing the mechanics to fit. Mm -hmm. you, 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 know, you know what I'm saying? So, like... I think I think it works because Mark developed. You know, I think you're absolutely correct, right? I haven't come across many because I think a lot of times we're trying to force certain situations into certain mechanics. It, it, you know, so, so the mechanics are driving the train, or it becomes, hey, I want a game that has to play in under an hour. So does that happen? You know, right, do you think because a, the the designer is necessarily set on delivering a certain type of mechanic, or because it's felt that the audience expectation is that it will fit into the niche of a, that certain type of mechanic, like a card driven game or a work placement game? Or I'm not sure I could think of any work placement war games off the top of my head, but the, hey, there, I'm I'm willing to be challenged on that assertion. I. Th I think so. I I, th I think there's a there's a large, um, right. There's just a lot of people trying to play to the mechanic in order to try to attract an audience, and I don't necessarily think that makes for a good game. You, you know, uh, you know, at, at any, you know, if I want to play something light and breezy, even it's you know, and it's just, it's a historical game. It's like, well, no, give me something where the mechanics express the historical situation well and let me mm -hmm. make interesting decisions you know rather than like 
hey, I, 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 I do think sometimes it's like, hey, we need games with, well, we're going to make a game with cards, because cards, people love cards. Well, sure. But I'm going to assert or, that even, even a super gruggy, hardcore war game, has, from a trusted designer especially, has an audience out there. I mean, I, I think Mark Herman did not expect, I mean, from what Mark says, he didn't expect uh, that reprint of Pacific War to be closing in on 1,500 pre-orders at this point, which is a really high number for GMT, by the way. And that's as, yeah. that game's as grog as they come. Well, I agree with you completely. I, th- I think it, I think that's all horse crap. I think there's a lot of board game geek debates out there, and it's 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 these strange Crip versus Bloods battle that really has to do with what it has to do what people are projecting onto the personalities of they imagine people have that prefer specific mechanics. You know, which is which is like a canard, a phony idea. Yeah, I find the idea of preferring specific mechanics absent other context to be a baffling one um right. i don't know why you would have a preference for a mechanic right other than to say this mechanic works well for this topic that makes that's a sensible statement right another sensible statement is you know like i really want a game that plays in under four hours because that's really all i can do Right. Oh, well, yeah, right, right. that's fair. Now, 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 that's not me, but I'm well, saying that's, neither, a, but... that's right. But that's the same rational statement that I can get. But, but we, we get to talking about mechanics instead. You, you, you know, you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. You know, and and that and that and and so ultimately, it's like, well, you know, instead of trying to make a game about this topic that couldn't possibly be covered, to do it any justice or for there to be any interesting decisions at x scale using these mechanics maybe you should use different mechanics or you should design for something else if you want to make a historical war game yeah well i mean there are there are topics that are suitable for being covered and you know scale matters as well there was a funny uh anecdote at the local board game club where me and a buddy were sitting down playing normandy 44 and uh, we had started relatively early. The whole thing opens at like 10 in the morning and we show up right away. We set it up. We were going. And the uh, the pandemic guys who were running a pandemic tournament that they came over and said, hey, uh, I don't know if you guys are going to be done anytime soon, but we want to run the pandemic tournament and we'd really like this table. And they weren't rude about it. I mean, it would have been cool had we said, no, you can't have this table. Are you guys going to be done soon? And we looked at each other, looked at the watch and said, yeah, we've been going for about eight hours so far. Uh, I, I think we probably won't be done for another three or four. They looked us looked at us like we were aliens. Right, it was a hilarious moment. That and that's right. that's fine. It's fine to say I prefer a game that takes less than two hours to play. Um, there, and there's a lot of people at that club who go whoa. If you talk about a game that will take more than two hours to play, and I, I mean two hours, not four hours. Um, so there's people that balk at games that take more than an hour. And again, that's fine to have that preference, but that's, you know, that's that's not where I'm interested. And I think you're uh, aligned with that. I'd prefer a meteor topic right. in, in game. But, that's, but, but I fully accept that that's, that's my preference and everybody doesn't share it. Right. I, I I think more practically speaking, I, I, I so I think that there, what, what, what we see in like these board game geek debates yeah uh, you know that that get into the mechanic you know mechanics versus mechanics and stuff so tell me it, is twilight struggle a war game right a- again right i think that all is basically some sort of weird sub niche in the hobby kind of um uh tr- tribal signifying arguments that really but they really don't mean anything you, you know what i'm saying you know you know you're talking no, about a mechanic, no they really you know? don't it's, you know, you're, you're t- for me, it's more important is, is is does the mechanic fit the scale and level of depth that the designer wants to provide in the you know in the game, and, and, and that's all subjective, right? Like you know, I might not enjoy a particular game because it, it's not getting too in depth on the topic. You know, right. I, I I I think there are some people out there who are you know you may not be very deep on a topic. You know, you're not that very well read about a particular topic so you're cool playing something that gives you kind of like a you know the game version of like the uh, 50 minute 
History Channel documentary. A very yeah, yeah. very broad right. sense of the history. Right. Some people are like, well, no, I, I really want to know about the history of this. Get deep, and I want to know about the military history of it. All right, well, that you know, that's going to require a different approach. So that's really what we're talking about. And, yeah. and it's and I'm not. And there's no judgment. That well, you hope not. It's either approach, right? Sometimes, right. sometimes people. It, well, sometimes people do issue judgment when they participate in these arguments, and and a lot of times, and I think more often, judgment is inferred by the listener that because we are saying this is not a war game, that we are therefore saying that it's it's somehow bad, and that's not. That's almost. I think that's almost never intended. I, you know, my my thing is like if there is no war. There is probably not a war game. Like, I'm very literalist as far as that goes. Probably right? it, not. Right? You know, if there is a war, there's probably a war game, Yeah, you, know, mm. you know, involved there. You know, that doesn't mean it can't be a political game or a historical game. You know, I play plenty of those. You know, you know, so, you know, it just, it all depends, man. You, you know, but, but I do think... Yeah, I didn't. So that I guess that's my point is I didn't set out to use any particular mechanics here. I just said, okay, I'm very familiar with a lot of different gaming mechanics, right? Um, both from my ho- yeah, mainly from my hobby. I'm also familiar with like some modeling design approaches from when I worked for DoD, right? I'm sure that and, helped. Uh, Eh, you'd be surprised. I'm just that's more of a way of just examining an operational situation and you know trying to quantify it. You, mm-hmm. you, you know, it's, 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 I think it gave me a lot of hope there. Then I did the research on the history and I kind of knew what scale I wanted to work at. And then I said, all right, let's choose mechanics that evoke that the best. You, you know, to give players as many choices as possible. It, you know, so you know because I don't want to do any scripting, so I'm gonna have to come up with mechanisms that. That, that allow people to play a game unscripted and kind of engage in their own strategy, you know, rather than, you know, nailing units down for five turns or, you know, limiting movement, you know, or anything like that. I didn't, I didn't want to do any of that in the game. Mm-hmm. So, and then the mechanics I chose express that. I, I didn't want to do, um, like, it's funny, there was somebody at uh, some form or something who said, I, I think, you know, they, they made the comment saying, you know, this game looks really neat. I'm still waiting for when somebody does like a, a separate tactical, so like a separate tactical game to resolve tactical combat for an operational game. And I was like, well, you know, I, I never considered that in this title. I, you know, it, you know, if I, I did briefly, you know, I thought about it. And I, I, I can thought, think, actually, I, I could think of an example that came up the other day of that type of thing. But uh, right. what the operational system that you have here does I think this is what you were about to say as I rudely cut you off um, I think does uh, show the <laughs> tactical effects on the operational situation um, without yeah. necessarily you know zooming into a battle board or something like that and playing out this little hex encounter affair of doing the engagement on a tech right. level right so that was choice number one right and I was like well I don't want to do that you know what I'm going to have a, a little some generic battle board so everybody would look at like the map that you we all see in front of us right, right. and then they look at some generic battle board and say well that's really lame compared to that map right okay, okay. right so that's option a option b is you go the way of the war in the pacific crazy land or that new barbarossa right. game they released right and you have oh, a 450 yeah. oh. right and you have a 450 dollar title with like really detailed battle boards and you know and, and i spent five years of my life designing this thing mm-hmm. right so so that ain't gonna happen and then um you know option three is you have some abstracted system like a a card based yeah you know something quick to actually mm-hmm. resolve the tactical combat and i think that would be just it would it wouldn't be it wouldn't sync up with the operation would feel yeah it would feel like it wouldn't fit Right, right, you know, and then lastly, you got to know, I, I would argue that there's enough bandwidth going on with this game as it is, you know, so, yeah, it, it, you know, but so you're right, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's a, there's an old military maxim um, that a commander should be aware of what's happening two echelons above him and two echelons below him, and that kind of impacted my overall design philosophy on this game and anything I do in the future. So I knew I wanted each player, like the U S player would be the commander of basically the equivalent of 
almost a core commander. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, he's going to have two divisions under him, right? So that's going to mm -hmm. be like his echelon. And that's kind of the same echelon for poor Senior Colonel Cam, you know, with the amount of forces that end up getting assigned to the area of operations, right? So, but from that level, I knew, okay... I need the game need so just like a commander, the game needs to be aware of what's happening two echelons up and what's happening two echelons down. So what that translates into game wise is like you just said, tactical effects might need to be simulated, you know, are in there um, in terms of like a die roll to go on patrol, right? You know, the effects of going on patrol or things that impact the combat results table, but even two levels down in the case of like, all right, well, I've got this detachment, but it has the signals intelligence capability that's amazing, right? So that thing's got to be modeled. Or MACV's concerns going on in this theater reflecting the, um, you know, how the reinforcements are done. So that, that was kind of my general approach was I, it all started with, here's the operation. Each player is the guy in charge of that operation on either side, mm -hmm. the forces assigned. And then from there... The considerations that I'm going to have to sum somehow take into effect, you know, take incorporate into this thing are going to be two echelons up and two echelons down. So literally speaking, from a military standpoint, if you went two echelons up from the uh, operational commander, you'd be at MACV. Mm -hmm. And if you went two echelons down from where he's at, all right, so you get to the next real command and control level, which is battalions. Okay. And then you get to the next one, which is companies. Mm, okay. Which is why did companies go? You, you follow me? So that's yeah. kind of everything that gets boiled up in this. And and when I say two levels, there are things that are going to affect those companies, and those are the things that get baked in, abstracted. Right. You, you know. So let's uh, let's close since we're we're closing in on time here um, with um, uh, a discussion about the status of the design. Now, clearly, the design itself is is essentially complete. The scenarios are essentially complete. Am I right about that? Yeah. All right. Done. So we're, you're just doing, uh, so you're basically completely done with the game, except for maybe minor tweaks to the play aids and uh, assembly of the playbook and uh, getting through the pre-order cushion on Legion games. So really, even the final art, uh, we're done. Like, like I'm like I told you. When I say tweaks, it's because we send it for final play test, right? So mm -hmm. we could absolutely, but that's just a matter of can we add more text, delete text, change text. What you see in the module, that's the final art for the play aids. Mm -hmm. everything. It's done. So um, it's final art, uh, final map, and counter art as well. Correct. Right. All done. So all we're really left doing, and and the rules are done. The scenarios are done. All I have left to draft up, which we're kind of like. It's half drafted, but but basically the playbook, the extended sequence of play, designer's notes, all that kind of stuff, as well as, you know, get, do pre-publication layout for the rules. So that's right now what we're looking at is if this thing can meet its number by the end of August, we could do a fourth quarter of 2020 release. If it doesn't meet its number by August, you know, I'm confident it'll eventually meet its number. Oh, right? sure. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's then, a good chunk of the way in already. Right. So, uh, you know, if it doesn't meet its number by end of August, then we're going to do a first quarter 2021 release. Mm -hmm. Well, so really, you know, barring coronavirus well, associated well, delays, too. R R Randy doesn't seem to think that'll have any impact. It hasn't had any impact on him publishing and, 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 and shipping um, Target for tomorrow. Okay, good. I mean, that's one advantage right. of a small operation is that you, the really small operations are all still working. His printer, his printer never shut down. Yeah. You know, so yeah, they're, they're, I don't think there's, uh, you know, I think, so th that doesn't even end. It's really just a matter of, do we meet the number? Can we do it? Right, right now, what we're waiting on, funny enough, is an unnamed, you know, waiting for my, my proofer to just get the proofed version of the rules back to me. Mm. He, he's just moving slow, but that's fine. We've got the time. There's not a lot of work left to be done. Once we get that, then we just have to sit down and do pre-pub layout. Mm -hmm. You're going to handle that yourself, or does uh, Legion handle that for you? Oh, I'm handling that. Okay, I've kind of figured. Uh, yeah, uh, so my artist Ben Sones is also doing pre-pub layout, and he's doing some original illustrations for it. 
and that, and that that's really important. I think the game needs so the rules is written or very much written in a reference style. Mm-hmm. You, you've seen them, you, you know. Yes. It's just refer to these rules. So the playbook. I mean, in the in the final version of the rules, it will say at the very beginning. It doesn't say it now, Gary, but it'll say, "Look, don't read these rules all the way through. Read them." You know, you know, glance over them, and then please go to the playbook and look at the extended example of play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. You know, take a look at that, then come back here and and read them and refer to them. So I made the decision that I wanted uh, the set of the rules. If somebody just sat down with them, probably would look pretty intimidating. But I, for this, for a game with this level of detail, I wanted the rules to be a good, solid, concise, organized reference. Even if that did not lend itself to ease of just you know reading it like it was a like a great comic book or a great book, yeah, you know what I mean, you know. But that's what the playbook's for. And bear in mind, and I think I, I pointed this out in one or both of the streams, that uh, admittedly, with the caveat that one of the players is the designer, um, so we had less need to look rules up. But I uh, very seldom it felt like I had to say, "Hey, Pat, what's you know how do we do this." i.e. rules reference in this. The, the game is basically playable off of play aids, uh, which right. is, uh, I think, a tremendous uh, advantage that you don't have to sit there and paw through the rules constantly. Yeah, and, that, and that's what the references with the... Uh, so the play test with the guys at, um, you know, the Snafu group, which were very important to me. I mean, don't get me wrong, their English is fantastic. So when I say this, I'm not, in, you know... Guys, if you're listening, I'm not insulting your English, but English is not their mother tongue. These are the Spanish folks? Right. Was it, was it you know Spanish? what I'm saying? Right. English is not their mother tongue. So it was very important to me to see those play tests kick off where they, you know, and they don't have the playbook and all the stuff that's, you know, that I'm talking about that we still have yet to do, right? Mm-hmm. So they were able to read the rules, look at the play aids, and have minimal referring back to the rules and flipping. And the rules were clear enough, you know what I mean, where it provided definition to them. And English is not their mother tongue. Mm. So, so it was kind of the same experience I had with like like when we did that first. Like we're going to be a little more competitive and just have fun and play and less like learn learning and trying to point everything out as we continue forward moving move with these scenarios. Mm-hmm. But what I tried to do with you in the play test was just that. Like I ne- I never said well okay Gary and now you do this. Like I'd throw advice out to you sometimes or I'd say well all right so. You want to do that? How does that work, right? And then you go back to the play, right? You know, you know, it, 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 you know that was purposeful because it, you know I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to display that about the game. It's one of the things that pleases. I, I think the thing that pleases me the most is just that fact: is that somebody can read the rules, refer to, the, refer back to them, but you're not constantly going back into that rule book and flipping through it for an operational game like that. Like you mm. can play off the play. You'll go back if it's something really weird or particular, or you want to know a very specific thing about that thing. So, so then you'll look on that pl- reference and then go look up the rules for like something very particular, but there aren't these strange exceptions like to combat or, right. yeah, you know, like, like a chart of it. Like, uh, like one good example is that we haven't done yet is the U S cash search mechanic mm-hmm. like for the campaign. Right. We're at, I, 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 we have enough room, so I'm going to add it to the ISR play aid, but it's, there's no way to relate it on that chart. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's just got to be, you got to go look back at the rule once or twice. You, you know what I mean? Right. You know, and how it's done and you'll be done with it. So, you, so nothing's perfect, right? You know, my goal is, is to, was to be perfect, but Ben, ben literally was, uh, you know, metaphorically going to get out a shotgun and kill me. He's like, there's no way to put what you want to put on a freaking chart, Pat. I was like, okay, Ben. Yeah, you know. He's like, refer them to the rules. I'm like, okay, Ben. Yeah, you know. But, um... Well, if th- there's not three... So, so uh, how, how much rules are there for that particular point? Oh, like, like... Uh, God, it, it, it... What do you mean by how much? Well, like, I, fun, I mean, how, many, yeah. how many paragraphs? Oh, like four. Okay, so it's not three pages of rules. No, okay. no, it's just it, right. It's just it's just just a, a little thing. too much to fit at the bottom of the play right. aid. Right. So what I can put on the play aid is there's this. Here's who can do it. Please refer to rule whatever. Right. Right. So that's an example of, of something I could. But other stuff that I could get on there that that what aren't on the charts we're playing with. We talked about the other day was like 
there are some limits to you know what can come from indirect fire and when can come mm-hmm. from air and all that well as i was watching and these guys were playing it and understood it and rolling through it not flipping through the rules but i still said to myself hey you know we could probably throw that info on the fires chart mm-hmm. right you know if you know so, so if anybody had a different you know that that's just enough you know so anything my goal with these plays is really to get them in there and i think you can only test them in their final art form right sure really get them to the point where it's like all right not just do i want them to be good and efficient and attractive but can i really get them so i've I've done the maximum I can to take the bandwidth off the player playing the game. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you know, minimal, minimalize his rules flipping time. So, you know, that that's been a player. I, I I think that in this final stage of things. But in terms of this being ready, we're talking about a tw- four quarter twenty twenty release or a first quarter twenty twenty one. Okay. And next on the docket is as we've discussed in a couple of the streams is Lamson seven nineteen. Yes. Yes. Have any idea what, uh, and, and we know you're doing research for that right now. Um, do you have any notion of what you would like to do next after that one? Um, I'm either going to do the Battle of Saigon during Tet or do something from the 1972 offensive. Mm-hmm. And, um, but really it feels, it feels so far in the future. I'm not sure. You know, I, I, I want to see what I feel like doing when I got done with, with, uh, when I get done with the Lamps on 719 title. Right. That's fair. The, the, um, if you had talked to me early on when I was doing this, my intention was to kind of chronologically walk through the war in Vietnam operationally. I don't so, think that idea is going to hold up, though. Right. Well, that, that was my idea then. Because so, that's not how I, you're in. I mean, that's not how my interest would evolve through the throughout the course of a project like that. Right. You're absolutely right. So... At the time, that was I was like I think I'll probably do Battle of Docto basically, you, you know, Operations mm-hmm. Greeley and MacArthur next. But when I got done with this, I said, you know, I want to do something really different from Vietnam. You, you know, uh, Greeley and MacArthur would feel a lot like this, but different. You know, mm-hmm. I wanted I wanted I wanted to do something like Lamson, where I've got a. I've got to have political considerations about like what Two's attitude is, and yeah, you know, is that going to get in the way of, you know. Arvin, certain Ar- Ar- Arvin divisions being able to move and fight on a given day, mm-hmm. you know, and, and um, the U.S. had like a de- had a deception campaign, so so like reinforcements in that campaign, and we're going to work completely. So all I wanted to tackle a bunch of different problems, you know, and and not and not feel like I was just tweaking what I was doing right now, mm-hmm. you know. I, I want to do something completely different, which would require a lot of changes in a ground up build, right? You know. And, and, and see what that requires. And after that, I might want to not, you know, I'm, so I could say I'd love to do Battle of Tet Saigon, but I don't know. You know, you know, how's mm-hmm. that? Yeah, no, that's, that's fair. That's, that's, uh, that's all hypothetical at that point anyway. All right. Um, did, uh, Gordon, did anybody have any questions from the chat that we want to ask? It does not look like Looks it. Looks like no. I would like to uh, thank Gordon for his service as moderator. We He was... He was volunteered to uh, to serve as moderator just in case there's uh, any idiocy occurring in the chat, which unfortunately did happen on a previous stream. I'm not sure which stream it was, but there there was uh, bad behavior on one of the previous streams. So I uh, would like to thank everybody for, uh, for coming tonight. Uh, Pat and I will be circling back to Thunder in the Ozarks, which is the Battle of Elkhorn Tavern. Uh, on Sunday, this coming Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern, and then first half of next week will be um, Victory Games Civil War, and the second half of next week will be Scenario 2, or the start of Scenario 2, of A Hot Dry Season. Exact schedule to be determined. Please stay tuned to the channel, and you'll see the uh, advertisements. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, showing up listening to me ramble. And You guys have for, a great day. And for dealing with our technical problems. Yes.